Nell Irvin Painter. We're so happy to have you here. Go for it, Claudia. Well, I just wanted to put in this introduction so that when people come on and we archive this, they'll know who's here and who we are and what's going on. So uh, Linda Musman and I, Claudia Bruce, welcome everybody who's joining us today for this Time to Talk conversation with Nell Irvin Painter. Linda and I are the co-directors of Time and Space Limited, a creative space in Hudson, New York that hosts many forms of art, including, but not limited to, the cinema, live theater music events, simulcast from the Metropolitan Opera, the Bolshoi Ballet, the National Theater of London, art installations, an active book space and stuff store, as well as our Time to Talk series that highlights conversations with artists and writers. TSL, born 49 years ago in New York City, has just completed its 30th year in Hudson. We gratefully thank all of our donors and members for their support, which makes discussions such as this one today possible. We also want to thank our tech person, Teo Camporiale, for getting this program up and Zooming. A recording will be archived on our website for later perusal. We are honored to have Nell Irvin Painter with us today. She is the Edwards Professor of American History Emerita at Princeton University. Among her many acclaimed books, including those that focus on Southern history of the 19th century are Standing at Armageddon, Sojourner Truth, A Life, A Symbol, Southern History Across the Color Line, and the New York Times bestseller, The History of White People. She holds an MFA from Rhode Island School of Design and a BFA from Mason Gross School of Arts. Nell Painter last visited TSL in December of 2018 in person after the release of her book, Old in Art School. We thought it was time to have another visit and Nell Painter accepted the invitation, this time via Zoom. To read all about the full depth and breadth of Painter's work as author, historian, and artist, visit her online at www.nellpainter.com. So back to you, Linda. Welcome now, Painter. So just want to show there's one of Nell's great books. And today we're going to be really, I'm hoping to do a, a you know, definitely want to focus on this great book on Sojourner Truth. Uh, we want to uh, dive in and with this conversation, let's start with your work on Sojourner Truth and the newly discovered court papers that have been found in the New York State Archives, which made great news just a couple of weeks ago. How convenient uh, for us. Uh, from the Albany Times Union, and I quote, they said, Buried in 5,000 cubic feet of court records, New York State Archives has uncovered the 1828 documents thought to be lost in history detailing how Sojourner Truth became the first black woman to successfully sue white men to get her son released from slavery, slavery, unquote. These court documents show the amazing victory of Sojourner Truth, how she won in getting her son freed from an Alabama slaveholder. So now give us a little background. I must say I'm, I had knew, uh, I've known Sojourner Truth my whole, you know, adult life of knowing history, but must say that I did not know that she was a northerner. You did it. No, and <clears throat> so you have opened my eyes. My neighbor, right across the Hudson River. I know, my neighbor. Ulster County, uh, in and around Kingston. She was, in, she, she was born enslaved. Uh, in about 1796, <clears throat> County, around Aesopus Creek or so. Uh, obviously, we don't know the details for sure. Um, and we have known, um, look, I should back up. Um, I published my biography in 1996. <clears throat> and it was one of three scholarly biographies that came out, no, four, that came out in the late 20th century. And we all knew 
that she had gone to court against the big family uh, spread in New York and in Alabama that had enslaved her and that had illegally shipped her young son, he was about six or so, um, uh, out of New York State after legal emancipation in New York in 1827 uh, to Alabama, to another part of this large elite family. Her name at the time was Isabella. Uh, and I figured that she had gone to court in the Ulster County um, a county a seat of Kingston in 1826. And so what I think was recently found were the documents as shipped to the state out of the county, out of Ulster County. I can't be sure of that. Also, I can't be sure that Isabella, then Isabella after 1843, Sojourner Truth was the first a black woman or the first black woman who had been enslaved to go to court uh, to gain custody of family members. There was at least one other case, I believe in Maryland, and I'm not sure of the date, I'm, um, but obviously this was something very rare and very hard to do. And it took a lot of internal fortitude uh, mm -hmm. on her part Isabella's part to to go against this very elite family that she had been connected to and remained connected to after the 1820s, after she was emancipated. Um, you know, the family relations uh, in slavery are very complicated and attachment flows across the color line. And attachment, as we know, doesn't mean love necessarily. It can also mean fear and hatred, but you can, you can be bound up with people you spend a lot of time with, especially a lot of time with when you're a child. And so part of my work in the book Claudia mentioned, Southern History Across the Color Line, is talking about these family type relationships that are cross-class and cross-race. So uh, at any rate, the discovery of these papers uh, in Albany became great news. For me, the news was that it was news because in the late 20th century, when I wrote, my book was not news. Uh, I am getting ready next year to write another biography of Sojourner Truth that's it's already um, contracted with Penguin Random House. And the working title is a personal biography of Sojourner Truth. But one of the things that I'll be able to say in that is the difference in the reception uh, of a woman like Sojourner Truth from the late 20th century to now. Now she can be news. Um, in the late 20th century, she was simply flattened out into a slogan that she did not say, yeah. aren't I or ain't I a woman? A white woman journalist made that up 12 years after the fact. And it has become a lazy tagline to reduce a fascinating, intelligent, strong, um, eloquent, religious figure, northerner, New Yorker, uh, into a slogan that does what we need her to do. She did that, but she did so much more. And the use of that slogan sets her up, the, the journalist who invented it was a woman named Frances Dana Gage. And Frances Dana Gage made up a scenario um, based on an actual event, but her making it up, in which Sojourner Truth saves the white women, the cowering white women. 
she's Sojourner Truth becomes the magic Negro. Now, I happen to have the notes of that actual meeting. And what Francis Dana Gage made up was an elaborate, a, a, a crucial elaboration of what went on in that meeting. But what Gage did was make Sojourner Truth a magic Negro. Mm -hmm. What we needed in the 20th century, but I think we no longer need now, is a magic Negro who is the only Black person against a backdrop of white people. It turns out that Sojourner Truth was not the only feminist abolitionist woman who was Black. There were others, notably Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, uh, who took a very energetic part in the suffrage meetings uh, right after the Civil War. And she actually was more emphatic um, about Black women's needs in suffrage than was Sojourner Truth. So I want to restore Frances Ellen Watkins Harper and other women, Black women, uh, to the world that Sojourner Truth was active in. I don't want to diminish Sojourner Truth. I want to let readers know more about her, but also about the world she lived in. Fantastic. There's so much to say. Uh, you know, in thinking about Sojourner, I was thinking about uh, Joan of Arc, which I believe you mentioned, also Jesus. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll throw a third one in, one of my favorites, Charlotte Corday. Uh, <laughs> different circumstances by all of them, but the fact that they're, they, you know, they are myths and they are used in, um, they're used to facilitate our dreams. Exactly. And I think Sojourner fits perfectly into that. She did not read, she did not write. She translated a narrative. She told a narrative to some yes. one named, uh, what's right. her name? Olive, uh, help me. Olive Gilbert. Olive, Olive Gilbert. Uh, she couldn't read what Olive wrote. So it's like Jesus and the uh, apostles. It was like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of information that we cannot verify, but the myth and the symbol, which is the basis of this book, mm -hmm. uh, clearly satisfy the need. And as you speak, I think it's really fascinating. And yeah. we are, you know, now we're, I mean, she, you know, the images that she sold, I think you should tell us a little about that and how she made a living off of her image. and sort of reminds me of the modern uh, Facebook, Instagram. She yes. certainly a woman ahead of her time. She was smart enough to know her value. She, she used the, the medium and the media of her time, which was uh, photography. As you said, Sojourner Truth, well, let me, let me back up a little bit. When we were talking about Sojourner Truth in New York State, we're talking about Isabella. Right. Mm -hmm first in Ulster County as simply Isabella, as an enslaved person who didn't have a right to a last name. And then uh, after she freed herself a year early before um, legal emancipation uh, in 1827 in New York State, she moved like so many country people in uh, New York State and New Jersey uh, moved to the big city. Remember, this is right after the completion of the Erie Canal, and uh, New York City was just taking off. It was a place to go uh, to seek your fortune and uh, to find um, to find good uh, employment, which she did. Uh, she took her son, who uh, stayed with her for, for a while, and then uh, went to sea. And like so many. Um, young people was lost at sea. But at any rate, um, as Isabella von Wagenen in the city, she moved with religious enthusiasts, let me call them. <laughs> um, one was the kingdom of Matthias, which was just a cult. And she was part of the cult. And I think it was impossible in the 20th century for people to understand the heroic Sojourner Truth, be, being part of this crazy cult 
around a guy who called himself the prophet Matthias. At any rate, she was there, as were many other Northerners. This is the uh, second awakening. This is a moment of enthusiasm. She got herself out of the kingdom of Matthias, uh, partly because Matthias ran off. Uh, and then in 1843, at another moment of religious enthusiasm, she made herself an itinerant preacher, sojourner, truth, set off in Brooklyn, went up the Connecticut River Valley, uh, telling people to uh, come to to Jesus right now because the world is going to end. This was Millerism, 1843. So she was one of thousands of Northerners believing that the world was going to end. Um, luckily for us, the world didn't end. And she spent, she went to Northampton to spend her first winter. She ended up staying for years. And in Northampton, she met a community of abolitionists and feminists. She also met Frederick Douglass. They were so different. Frederick Douglass was making himself into the Frederick Douglass we know. He was shortly um, out of, of enslavement. And he was making himself into um, someone who could speak in public as a learned person. He was making himself into a great man. She was still getting her, her knowledge, her words, her persona from another power, which she called the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's how she presented herself in public, that is, as someone inspired. And that's how we know her as an inspired speaker, but she's very different from Frederick Douglass. So, um, so, so now, can I interrupt you a moment? Uh, just Claudia is, has one of the songs that uh, the so sang, yeah, and would like to sing it if oh, you. Uh, uh, I think you'll. She's looked it up, and we have we have it ready. So we want to just give a little taste of one of the songs. This was a song, in my understanding, that she that was written about the itinerant preachers who were roam, who were going throughout the country yes. when she became Sojourner Truth. Uh, yeah. And the name of the person who wrote it escapes me, but it was when she was with the Millerites as this was one of the songs that was um, that, that was in their repertory. And it's in their millennial hymnal, which I looked up. Here o'er the earth, as a stranger I roam. Here is no rest, is no rest. Here as a pilgrim, I wander alone. Yet I am blessed, I am blessed. For I look forward to that glorious day when sin and sorrow will vanish away. My heart doth leap while I hear Jesus say, There, there is rest, there is rest. Here fierce temptations beset me around. Here is no rest, is no rest. Here I am grieved while my foes me surround. Yet I am blessed, I am blessed. Let them revile me and scoff at my name. 
laugh at my weeping, endeavor to shame. I will go forward, for this is my theme. There, there is rest, there is rest. There, there is rest, there is rest. Thank you, Claudia. I mean, I, I think, um, the spirit, the size of this woman speaking, uh, my fantasy of this woman uh, and her, the spirit that moves her and moved her, uh, the fact that she spoke about her strength and her ability to work like a man, uh, that, that is, she is uh, definitely a uh, opposed to Mr. Douglas, this is a working class. This is a worker who's speaking. Well, he, was a worker. he was definitely a worker. There's no question of that. They both. I know, but but I don't perceive him as that. As in in my perception of him and his suit and his finery of who he became. No, you, I, you should keep it all together. Yeah, I know. That's where why you as a historian have to help us. Okay. <laughs> Because I am way behind on a lot of the people of this era, uh, to be sure. And I think for me, meeting Sojourner and, and having, having the opportunity to meet her through you is really a guide that helps expand my knowledge, my personal knowledge. Because I think, uh, you know, as a historian, I think history is always slippery. It's a slippery thing. That's it's so interesting. And, uh, you know, it is all about biography. I mean, how we perceive it and how we write it and how we think it um, to some degree. It's um, a lot about biography. It's and, a lot about biography. It's a lot about money. It's a lot about political power. And those are all bound up together. Yeah. Of course, gender and race. We're not there yet. I mean, we got to go there yet today. We never will be. <laughs> You know, it was it Stalin said, doesn't matter how you vote, it's who counts the votes. Yeah, yeah, who counts? So, you know, this, this is where we are right now. And, and I think history suffers from that too. Anyway, thanks, Claudia. Thank uh, Claudia. I'm going to come back to you when I turn to my Sojourner Truth biography. Uh, I hope this fall. Right now, I'm finishing a collection of my essays called I Just Keep Talking. And that should go into press uh, by the summer. Wow, I hope you come back and talk some more because I love what you talk about. I mean, I am a you know, feminist mm -hmm. uh, for sure. I think talking about others and people that don't quite fit in just makes me really happy. Good. Uh, when she talks about the spirit or we talk about the spirit and Jesus and all that, I'm not a religious person, but I do think her intuitional skills must have been extraordinary. Yes. So that's what I'm going to attribute it to. So you can do that. But I think we actually need, I mean, I am not religious either. Uh, I like going to the right kind of church, which is kind of hard to find. You know, <laughs> I don't want to go to an all white church. I don't want to go to an all black. And all, I'm fine with an all black church as long as it's not a shouting church, not evangelical. Mm -hmm. I grew up um, in a Methodist church, a black progressive Methodist church in Oakland, California. And that's the kind of church I liked. They're very hard to find. Mm -hmm. uh, but at any rate, um, I am not uh, one for religious enthusiasm in my own life, but I deeply respect what Sojourner Truth and many other nominally powerless people used as their source of strength. And for her, she called it the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So I respect the power of the Holy Spirit. It works. Yeah. Now she talked about when she almost went back with, uh, what's his name, Dumont, her yeah. owner. Yes. And she was almost ready to go back. Yeah. And somebody told her, the yeah. spirit told her to get out and yeah. run away. 
Yeah. And the same thing with the first slave, the when she was sold to the Neelys, I believe, yes. who were beating her because nobody could understand each other. Yeah, she asked her father. Oh, well, she asked the spirit and and yeah, the father to come. Yeah. But she spoke Dutch. She was working for people that didn't speak Dutch. No wonder there was a lack of communication. And they spent, uh, the, somebody beat her. Uh, for not understanding. For not understanding, et cetera. And her father, she prayed that her father would come. And yeah. he did. Let's pause for a moment over Dutch. Yes. Uh, the Hudson Valley uh, was in the 18th century, largely Dutch speaking. But over the course of the century, uh, English speaking people came in and became powerful. And over the course of the 18th century, Dutch became the language of poor people and peasants. So by the time she was born, and then in the early 19th century, uh, Dutch speakers were not the, uh, were not 100% of the population in the Hudson Valley. So when she moved, she, when she moved to New York, she definitely had to um, make her way in English. She never learned to read and write. Uh, people tried to teach her. She said that she got her inspiration from her sources of inspiration. She did use photography because she realized that people who did read and write were representing her in ways that she didn't want to be represented. Notably, um, uh, oh God, Uncle Tom's Cabin, <laughs> Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote a really stupid essay in 1863. Um, and part of it was saying that Sojourner Truth was dead. But Sojourner Truth said, if you want to know the real me, buy my photographs and buy my narrative. And the legend she put under her photographs was, um, I sell the shadow to support the substance. So she made her way economically as a working person, as long as she could work, but by selling her book and by selling her photographs. So that was a very... Um, postmodern way of uh, making, of self-fashioning. And she owned her own house, right? She did. Um, in in uh, Florence, which is right next to Northampton, mm -hmm. which is absolutely amazing. How many Americans in the middle of the 19th century owned their own homes? How many women? This is at the time, uh, um, I'm not sure about uh, couverture in New York State at the time, but it certainly would have been difficult, if not legally impossible, for women to own property in New York State. And certainly for people who had been enslaved, who had spent so much of their working lives without earning wages and without ways of saving. So it's absolutely extraordinary. And this is the sort of thing I want to talk about. You know, it's so easy to say, oh, she learned everything she knew from the experience of being enslaved. And that simply is not the case. She learned a lot in her 30 years of enslavement, but she also kept learning and she kept using her knowledge. We talk about image. One thing I'm always fascinated with that she kept the knitting in her lap. Yes. I was so impressed with that. That's my favorite one. In some of the, in one of the others or some of the others, she has a photograph of her son uh, who was in the Union Army and others, she is not holding things. But since I'm a knitter. Nice. I know, I wanted to bring that in there. Yeah, um, I wanted to use the one with knitting. I, I discovered that photograph um, in the American Antiquarian Society. And I almost, maybe I did shriek aloud when I discovered that photograph. Also the hand that is crippled, is that? Yeah. Well, she, Go ahead. While she was still enslaved, she had um, a working accident. And of course, working accidents happen to people who work 
all the time. And so she had um, a misshapen hand. I think it was even her right hand. Mm -hmm. But if she had meant to present herself as a pathetic former slave, she could have held her hand up like that. And in fact, carte de visite, which is what those photographs were, uh, were very popular in the 1860s and 70s. And some of the people who used them were um, injured veterans who would hold up their broken part and say, here, I will give you my photograph if you will give me money and I have suffered for the union cause. She didn't do that. In some of them, you can see as she's holding a cane that her hand is not quite right, but she was not uh, showing off her wound from slavery. She wanted to show herself as a bourgeoise, as a well-dressed, well-composed woman. Plus there's a Quaker quality to- The clothing. The clothing as well, which was part of the cults that- uh, it was Part of women who spoke in public, mm -hmm. who were not floozies or were not uh, actresses. So, if you wanted to be respected as an intellectual who was speaking as a woman, then uh, you would wear this very severe Quaker black and white. Not all the photographs are in uh, severe Quaker clothing. Some of it is fashionable clothing. So um, wanna, I wanna get to your paintings, but I, I don't wanna skip over the two speeches the one that that the aren't I a woman, ain't I a woman, yes. the, the, the fabrication of uh, Sojourner Truth's text. Uh, and could yeah. you just go into that a little bit? I mean, I have them, but I think you can do it. Pages with the different text. Yes, I have them. I mean, it, she starts out with... Uh, Who's okay. writing now, Linda? Just, just, okay, just hold that for a second, Linda. Yeah. And I'll set it up. Okay. So um, 1851, early 1851, Sojourner Truth has in her hand her narrative. And she was going around to feminist abolitionist meetings. And in 1851, the feminist community was also an, ab a, an abolitionist community. And the abolitionist community was feminist. So she's going around to these meetings to say what she wanted to say, but also to sell her book. She's on a book tour, basically. And um, the meeting that, that we focus on uh, was in Northern Ohio, in Salem, Ohio. And I have read the newspaper that was advertising the meeting, and it was calling for all feminists, all abolitionists, to meet on women's rights. So the call for the meeting also asked for anti-slavery people. It was a meeting that was well attended, women as well as men, women who spoke up and defended themselves. And Sojourner Truth was one of several women speaking up. Now, if you would read part of what the recorder, the recording secretary took down. Just read part of that for us, Linda. Uh, the Marius Robinson yes. said, she said, may I say a few words? I want to say a few words about this matter. I am a woman's rights. I have as much muscle as any man and can do as much work as any man. A little bit more. Let's see. I have plowed and reaped and husked and chopped and mowed and can, and can any man do more than that? I have heard much about the sexes between being equal. I can carry as much as any man and I can eat as much too, if I can get it. Okay. I am as strong as any man that is now. Great, okay. So um, the sentiment is there. The sentiment is that I have worked I am a woman worker and I deserve my rights. It is in standard English. 
in the 20th century, people did not want authentic, formerly enslaved women to speak in standard English. She also is a New Yorker speaking in, maybe she had a, she probably did have a Dutch accent at this point, but at any rate, she is not speaking Southern. So this is 1851. That is the account of Maurius Robinson, who was uh, the uh, recording secretary who was taking down speeches as they were being given. So that is contemporaneous with, with um, the utterance. And for historians, that counts for a lot. So that's 1851. So as the years go by, uh, Sojourner Truth is on the feminist abolitionist speaking uh, circuit. She's well known. Usually um, the newspaper articles didn't quote her. They said uh, she was there, but you know she doesn't get a lot of play. By the Civil War, then the question of the Negro became mute. And by 1863, the best known, best selling author on the Negro, Harriet Beecher Stowe, wrote an article called Sojourner Truth, the Libyan Sybil. And Sojourner Truth comes out of Harriet Beecher Stowe's pages as a kind of quaint darky who's also dead. Um, but she, Harriet Beecher Stowe quotes Sojourner Truth as confronting Frederick Douglass. And Harriet Beecher Stowe does something that would occur time and again in American letters of using a black woman to take down a black man. So for Harriet Beecher Stowe, Frederick Douglass is saying that those who are enslaved should seize their freedom. And for Harriet Beecher Stowe, Sojourner Truth rises up uh, this powerful figure. She confronts Frederick Douglass and she says, Frederick, is God dead? Meaning, Frederick, do you doubt the power of God to end slavery? And as Harriet Beecher Stowe sets it up, this powerful figure of Sojourner Truth rises up silences Frederick Douglass and electrifies the meeting. 1863, April. Within two weeks, Frances Dana Gage, feminist abolitionist journalist, now in 1863, working in South Carolina with Freedmen's Relief, reads this and says, Sojourner Truth is not dead. I've got a better Sojourner Truth. And she publishes also in April, 1863, her version of Sojourner Truth in which she uses much of the, the infrastructure of Harriet Beecher Stowe's article to insert Sojourner Truth. So she has Sojourner Truth rising up, uh, uttering a rhetorical question not Frederick is God dead, but aren't I a woman? She says, aren't I a woman? Because in the 19th century, that's how working people talk. They said, aren't. So this is 1863 after Harriet Beecher Stowe for Francis Dana Gage, also the electrifying presence of Sojourner Truth quieting everybody. So Gage used Stowe's um, drama, but reinserted her version of Sojourner Truth. Over the passage of the 19th century, what audiences wanted from Sojourner Truth was the faithful pilgrim. They wanted Frederick is God dead. So where she appears in Negro history in the 19th century and early 20th century, she's the faithful pilgrim. She's Frederick is God dead. By the 20th century, when feminists need a black woman, because most of what was portrayed as 
the Negro movement was all men and what was portrayed as the women's movement was all white women. We need somebody who can get in there and do both. They find, and I'll, tell, I'll come back to that in a second, they find Francis Dana Gage's Sojourner Truth and they find, aren't I a woman? And they think, all right, that doesn't sound right. All the slaves were in the South and we know that Southerners don't say aren't, so we gotta say ain't. Mm -hmm. So then it gets made into ain't I a woman? And the assumption is that somehow Sojourner Truth was enslaved in the plantation South because that's where all the enslaved people were, weren't they? I mean, it, you know, the ig ignorance was absolutely amazing. Now, where did they find Sojourner Truth? Where did the people making women's history find Sojourner Truth? They found her in a very late 19th century collection of primary source materials on the women's movement, the women's, it's called the history of women's suffrage. Sojourner Truth is the only Black woman so um, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, for instance, is not there. Other Maria Stewart is not there. Um, so if you're trying to find some women's history and you need a black woman, and what's the primary sources, it's history of women's suffrage. And so that's how Frances Dana Gage's Sojourner Truth gets into second wave feminism. Plus, we want to add that there was a Southern dialect added to the speech. Well, yes, that's right. I'm glad you mentioned that. Well, yeah. chillin' war dar's so much racket, dar yeah. must be something out of kilter. I'm I mean, so the whole thing is- uh, Wrote in dialect. Yes, dialect, which mm -hmm. adds another level of- So-called. Um, so-called authenticity. Yes. And, and um, it was, I've had so many people argue with me <laughs> that Gage's truth sounds like Sojourner truth. And that's another thing I'm going to talk about in my new Sojourner truth book. Just, I mean, my book came out, what, a quarter of a century ago. I have been struggling for a quarter of a century against aren't I, ain't I a woman? Well, the struggle goes on. It's, it's amazing. I mean, there's also the story, the story of her burying her breast. Um, yeah, uh, which is true or false, I guess. Um, it is true, but it's in a very different way. So the way it gets into lore is she's standing uh, in front of a big meeting with lots of men. And they say, well, we doubt your womanliness. And she goes, ah. <laughs> what happened was she did get doubted, but there was a lot of squeamishness. So they took her behind a screen and she kind of did. Ah. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing how, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, we live, you know, we live with all of these myths about, you know, George Washington, he certainly, you know, the cherry tree, Abe had an ax and a log cabin and yada, yada, yada. But imagine if that's all we knew about George Washington. I know, it's just like, it's so interesting, all of the sort of information about Sojourner and, you know, I love her name, she's truth. I mean, that's, what else can you say? The truth. Yeah. So people are asking about your artwork. Yeah. <clears throat> we want to, we don't want to skip over that. Uh, people have looked at your website and uh, one of the questions is looking at some of your artwork on your website, you paint a lot of words. Yeah. Sandra yeah. Moore's asking that and Sandra, Sandy's on. She's interested uh -huh. in hearing about. Yes, I see you. Uh, you have two things in common. Sandy will be showing a work here in the gallery and so will you. So we're Good. hoping we all meet soon yeah so talk about your artwork and your other genius yeah um so um i got my mfa um let's see a decade and a year ago 2011 and when i was in art school uh 
over five years, uh, people kept, my teachers kept slapping me down against using what I knew of history or using text. And so for a long time, I shied away from using words in my work. Though I must say, the first pieces I made um, did use words, just a kind of, oh, I've got to get some words. And um, that was in 2011. Um, and actually, Eddie Gloud, um, now a famous uh, uh, public intellectual, bought the last piece of that series uh, a couple of years ago. But after that, I didn't use words for the longest time. It's taken me kind of a decade to get to where I felt comfortable using words. And now I use a lot of words. And I, I kind of chastise myself for, for shying away. But, you know, it just took a while to be able to pull the two parts of myself together. So um, I mentioned to you my collection of essays. I just keep talking. Mm -hmm. So when my agent was shopping that around, I put in the manuscript between each of the essays, a piece of my existing artwork so that, that whoever would buy the book would know there's going to be art in it. And Doubleday accepted it. Doubleday uh, bought it. And so in May of this year, God willing, assuming that I get in at Yado, um, I will be making new artwork that goes with um, the essays. And then uh, I'm, I'm assuming all will go well and <laughs> that book will be in press in the summer. And then in the fall, knock on wood, I will be going back to Wyoming uh, to you, Cross, to start Sojourner Truths, the personal biography. I don't know how much art I'll be able to make then, but there will be art in that book because when I contracted it with Penguin Random House, I contracted about 20 pieces of original art. Fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Reminds me of Mr. Seabald, who likes to put pictures. Right. Well, he was one of uh, one of the that um, Austerlitz was one of the works that helped me see that I could use both sides of my brain. <laughs> His um, eyes a little foggy and hard to see, but that's right, part right. of the charm. Sure. But you know, um, last summer and fall, I chaired the nonfiction jury of the National Book Awards, and we started with six hundred and seventy books getting down to a long list of 10 and finalist of five and a winner of one. So I read and looked and lived with a lot of nonfiction books. And I will tell you that nonfiction now is much friendlier to images than it was 10 years ago. Fantastic. So we wanna, uh, I guess, I think you posted something about Faith Rheingold today. Yes, I, I did. I don't know. If, you know, when talk a little bit about that. You're... Yeah, uh, I don't know if I can easily put my hands on the newspaper. If you want me to get it, I can. I get it out of recycling. <laughs> but, um, Faith uh, Ringold, who is 91 years old, born in um, 1930, so she's even older than me, which is hard to do. Uh, no, no, no. Faith has been working since the 60s, mm -hmm. and um, she has kept working, which is absolutely amazing. You know, when I was in art school, I learned how hard it was for women artists to get their art seen, their art exhibited and bought. And so I ask... Um, Pat Steer, for instance, I said, how did you keep going? I asked Howardina Pendel, how did you keep going? And they said, basically, pure spite. I just kept going. And um, when, I was, um, when I was an undergraduate at Mason Groves, I went to the CCA meeting in New York where uh, Faith Ringgold was speaking. And she said, 
perhaps in answer to a question, it wasn't my question, but it was somebody's question uh, about keeping going. And she told a story about um, when she was unhappy that no one was writing about her work. When you're a visual artist, it's absolutely crucial that other people write about your work. She said, she said to her daughter, the distinguished uh, cultural uh, critic and historian, uh, Michelle Wallace, she asked Michelle to write about her work. And Michelle said she's doing her own writing. And then she, uh, Faith, asked her friend, uh, Florence Kennedy, what am I going to do? Nobody's writing about my work. And Florence said, write your own damn self. And I have taken that to heart. That's what, one of the reasons I wrote Old in Art School, write your own damn self. And um, Faith did that with her story quilts and her books. She wrote her own damn self. She kept going. So finally, she has a really big retrospective at the new museum. Holland Carter, the uh, senior, one of the senior art critics in the New York Times, big three page story, two and a half page story starting above the fold on the first arts page, all these images, all this uh, uh, talk with her and about her work. It's absolutely amazing. And noting that she managed to keep going. Helen Carter um, gives an anecdote. Um, and I don't know if Faith Ringel told him the way he says it. I have not heard it the way it's in the newspaper. And that is that in the 60s, this is the early 60s, when the big black men artist uh, like Romare Bearden um, started Spiral because they wanted to make their art well known, but they also wanted to have a say in what was going on in civil rights. And so it was um, all these uh, black men artists. And Faith, who was their peer, um, approached Romare Bearden and showed him her work and she wanted to join the group. And Romare Bearden sort of said, well, you need to keep working and pretty soon you'll get good enough <laughs> and sent her away. Um, they did accept one woman who was very young, Emma Amos, who was very young, very cute and light-skinned. And that was, she was the only woman in Spiral. So Faith had to keep going and she used her own skills, the skills of her mother and her imagination to make this amazing, now huge body of work. She just kept going. Was she part of the Heresies group? When Linda and I were in, in Manhattan, yeah, we both got there in 69. We yeah. didn't meet until 76, but uh, there was a whole group. I know all the people you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, and I just wondered if they were also involved. She in was active. Um, she knew that the white women were not 100% allies. You know, this is the thing. Yeah. But she was very active in um, feminist circles in New York, which were, of course, mostly white. So talking about image, I'm yeah. $20 bill fascinates me. I'm, yeah. I'm okay. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. I don't see your name, but I see your face. The woman who asked about the art. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Yeah, yeah, I hear you now. Okay, so um, having uh, gone to art school in the 70s, uh, when I guess it was an appropriate time being graduate school in, in, in my oh, early 20s, oh, yeah. I was completely discouraged as a woman from painting. And I, you know, uh, blonde white woman, I just completely discouraged uh, from painting and from work and told I couldn't draw. Yeah, me too. And, and, um, and, and no matter what I said to the, to the teacher, it was just like, you can't draw, you, these aren't drawings. I was showing them beautiful drawings I know are beautiful and still. Yeah. These aren't real drawings. And, and I think something, I, I've, 
I'm now still painting. I'm 70 and I'm still painting and I'm continuing. I'm expecting to continue persevering. Uh, it, it has not been a warm and fuzzy world for me either at all. And uh, up here in the Hudson Valley, there's not too many people who will write about art intelligently anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's a big problem. But um, I think that the, if you, there's something about writing words, which is, I kind of didn't for a very, very long time. And then, I mean, painting words, painting words. Ah, yes. They just started coming up. And, and there's a difference between a word that's written in a, it typed into your computer and a word that's painted. Yes. It is, it's got color, it's got, it can fade into something, it can, it can wrap around somebody's head, whatever it is you need to do. And right. it can be so expressive of the thought you're trying to, to get out differently than just painting the image of the right. thing you're trying to do. And I, I love that in your work. And I also um, embrace it. I, I know Basquiat had to throw words in his work. You know, I think that a lot of artists reach a certain point where there's so much to say that they've got to paint. They have to paint words. They have to paint words. Yeah. And and I mean, you know, you can you can write a few notes that you hand out to people or whatever with your artwork, but still you want to you want to get those thoughts over to them, you know. And and I think also as we advance in age, that maybe there's a kind of a logoria that happens because we are. We have so much to say. Yes. You know, and, and we're not afraid to say it. We're not afraid to say it. we have so much to say. There really no. is something to the idea of older people being wise. You yeah. know, <laughs> we're not living in a world that treats it like that's true, but it is so clearly true. And particularly if you hang out with women and you you just realize how smart they are. And how much they have to give and share, you know? And I mean, not that guys don't too, but but women, just amazing, the kind of brilliance that comes out. And I like this very much in your work. I wanted to thank Good, you for thank that. Thank you. Yeah. So I have another question for you now. Here. Uh, we have the $20 bill discussion. Right. So why Harriet and not truth? Um, well, for if one, we can never get there. For one thing, a lot of people get the two of them confused. So it may be that on that day it was Harriet, and on another day it was Sojourner because they couldn't tell. Um, I think Harriet Tubman's story is more straightforward. Uh, we don't have words from her, for one thing. But we know that she was from slavery to freedom and she was taking people out of bondage. Uh, that's a really good story. And it's true. You know, it's not like the complications around Sojourner Truth and the slogan. So if, if somebody asked me which Black woman from the 19th century should go on a piece of American money and it's only one, I would also say uh, Harriet Tubman. And I will also add that um, Taya Banks, who, uh, Miles, sorry, Taya Miles, uh, who won the National Book Award last year for all that she carried, is going to be writing a personal biography of Harriet Tubman in the same series that I'm writing in. Wow. So we're getting over an hour. I don't want to overwhelm you and take up your time, but it's been fantastic. I have a whole lot of other things I was going to bring up, like why are we obsessed with liars and grifters right now? <laughs> um, the short answer is I don't know, and I don't think it's right now. Uh oh, this good is point. A long-standing American concern, and maybe not just American, maybe maybe Western culture, but maybe not just in Western culture. Um, what I don't understand is why um, there's so much concentration in, well, I was going to say movies, but TV and music and, and entertainment on death, on, on killing and hurting. Mm -hmm. um, that disturbs me. I know it's long. I, I suspect that it's 
more intense now, but I don't know. All right, here's another one. Uh, the CRT discussion, cultural race theory. Uh huh. Like critical, um, critical race. Theory. I'm sorry, critical. What did I say? Yeah. Cultural, yeah. critical, CRT. I mean, there's all these initials. Yeah. So like, I mean, is that a product of uh, Black Lives Matter or it's the product of white? white the white supremacy or... so when you say crt it's the yeah. republicans who tend to use the acronym because they can't remember it or re remember what it is they just know it's something that has to do with black stuff yeah it's taking away from them and we had after the civil war there was reconstruction and during reconstruction there was a moment of black flowering, uh, kind of like what we're in now. Um, one of my graduate students, Jane Daly, wrote her dissertation and first book about the backlash against black success. Mm. And that's what you're seeing again. Um, I have a piece coming out in the Husek Journal uh, right about now. Um, 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 1872 to 1876 in one year. And I mean, I am not, I know the world is shitty right now. I know our country is shitty right now. But you know, I don't go around wringing my hands because when I look around, I see so much wonderful stuff going on. Uh, you know, just to read the arts pages and the times, you know, it's so encouraging. Um, I am Madam Chairman of McDowell, which is, I say, the most prestigious wow. art uh, colony in the country. And we're working very hard to make sure that our diversity and equity and access, access is right. And I see this all over. I see it over and over again. And I see so much of Black and um, and Latino success going on. I see people asking why are um, Asian Americans leading orchestras? You know, we have so many questions that are that are alive right now, and so many answers that are coming out. It's like 1872. So the backlash against uh, black uh, uh, Black History Month against critical race theory, against white privilege, against what the French call wokeism. wokeism. <laughs> yeah, um, all of that is something that happened before in the late 19th century. And it worked, it worked. It, um, the backlash brought us segregation and exclusion and lynching and murder and redlining and all those things it works and it may work again white people are touchy and powerful and ignorant and on that note <laughs> <laughs> i'm all i'm in awe of your brilliance and i love the fact that you're not gonna stop talking that's and right. I'm very excited that you will hopefully keep talking to us here at TSL. It's very, very important to hear your voice and be included in your circle. And we're so excited that you're going to be here showing well, your artwork I'm and here. returning to TSL. We're, okay. we're very, very excited. So I want to uh, thank you again and wish you all the best and say right on yeah. now. Yes, and painter. We'll, we'll talk soon about the art. Okay, okay. great. great. Thank, Thank you, Nell. You. Thank you, Nell Painter. <laughs> Thanks everybody for listening in. Dude, bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>